Okay, folks, let's get started today. Thursday, 13th, I guess. Um, okay, so as promised, new assignment, assignment three. You're going to be breaking some crypto. Um, this uh, is up now. The grade scope stuff will all be there at 2 p.m. So you can get all the stuff you need at 2 p.m. Uh, essentially, to break it down before you start looking into it, the goal is there'll be four different parts, basically four different ciphers. You'll each have your own cipher text, so you go to Gradescope, you'll just submit literally anything, it doesn't matter what, and it will give you your cipher text to use for that part. Uh, you figure it out, break the key, and then submit the key in a readme along with any code that you use uh, to help you break that. And then it will um, we'll be able to get feedback right away. I'm going to go over it very briefly now because the TAs are going to do virtual recitation on Friday, so they'll cover it much more in depth. Um, and it is up, it will be up at two for you to read. Uh, but the basic idea is the first one is a um, Caesar cipher, just the same thing that we saw in class. So this is practice breaking a Caesar cipher, A through Z, all caps. The second test is a visionaire cipher, same thing, A through Z, all caps, just like we talked about in class. And then we, so these are kind of warm-up problems to help you get used to solving these. I even, I have links to automated solvers here, so you can double check your work and uh, know that you're making progress. But the skills that you're developing here are going to help you a lot on the next ones. So uh, parts three and four are um, essentially Caesar cipher and visionary cipher with a twist. Now instead of shifts, we have XORs with bytes. So our alphabet is not A through Z, it's 0 to 255 represented as ASCII values. Um, so there's code here for Python, C, and Java of the different implementations of these so that you can read through it to understand how it works. You're free to use these, these functions in your code when you're testing it. Whatever you want to do um, is good. The one trick, and the TAs will talk about this more tomorrow, is so, OK, let's think about this. So we have one. Cipher, it's the alphabet is 0 to 255. Um, in the ASCII alphabet, what of those characters are printable? table, we can see in hexadecimal, which is always a nice one to look at, you can see there's a zero. So zero is a null byte. Uh, there's tabs. Um, I think basically everything above 7f is also not. So there's a ton of non-printable characters there. Um, there's a lot of these characters here, less than 20, are not printable. Um, so I can't give you just, so it's hard for the website to communicate to you what the uh, ciphertext is if it's in all this gobbledygook and you can't see it. So what we use is we use an encoding. So we're going to use a uh, base64 encoding. Um, this is a, basically looks kind of like this. White space isn't important. And all of the examples have functions in their specific languages of how to base64 decode something. So you get a base64 string on the website. You put it in your program. You base64 decode it. And now you have the ciphertext byte that you Again, the TAs are going to go over this in more detail. They have experience with this, so they'll definitely be able to help you out. So yeah, the basic goal is do everything that we talked about in class and um, use the techniques to break uh, the techniques. Questions? Well, you know where to find us. Office hours, Piazza. All right, now to symmetric key crypto. All right, so what were we talking about on Tuesday? So what was important about this box? Thank you. 
them doesn't quite matter here, but if we are able to create keys with this properties, we talk about it and we saw that we can get really awesome things that people can leave me a message in my box and uh, I know that it hasn't been tampered with. Um, you can also verify that a message is from me. Cool. And, okay, cool. So we will see, okay. So we're gonna get into um, different properties here. So we're gonna go through them, talk about them. We're gonna see how we can get confidentiality and non-repudiation, which are great properties. Um, but we have a key requirement here. So this is fundamentally different than symmetric crypto, where we had the exact same key that both parties needed to know. So for this, even this box scheme to work, if you have my public key, what should you not be able to do? Yeah. Generate your private key. Yeah, generate or figure out my private key, right? Because I give the public key to literally everyone. It's in the name of public. Or the secret key is kept with the user. So, or it's kept secret, I don't give it to anyone. So that means if all of you have it, it should not be possible to derive the secret key from the public key. All right. The other assumption we're gonna make, and we'll talk about how, what this actually um, affects real system, is we're gonna assume that everyone knows everyone's public key, including our attackers who are gonna introduce Eve, our, our adversary, our eavesdropper. So everyone, including Eve, knows the public key, so Alice and Bob, but does not know their secret keys. Okay. Let's start using some notation. So. All right. So we have a message M. We have public key of Alice, uh, secret key of Alice, uh, public key of Bob, secret key of Bob. And then we have Eve over here, and Eve could have her own uh, public key of Eve and public key of and secret key of Eve. Whoa. What else of this does, so think about it from different people's perspectives. So from Eve's perspective, what does she know? Uh, Alice and Bob's public keys. Alice and Bob's public keys um, and her own public key and her own secret key, right? So some way you can go through the same steps with, with um, Alice, Alice knows Bob's public key, her own public key, her secret key, and maybe Eve's public key. Okay, so we're gonna use these just like functions. So we're gonna just say, okay, well, we'll go into a little bit more details about how this uh, operation is actually done. But for now, we can just say, well, if we pass a message, if we encrypt a message with Alice's public key, then that gives us some ciphertext C. Okay, so we're going to think about this in terms of a black box. We're not going to worry about the details too much right now. So we'll think about this as a black box. So we encrypt. So now, how do I decrypt this message? Private key. Yeah, the private key. So this is like the lock system. So we can lock it one way. Now the message is now locked. And the only way to go backwards is with the secret key. So if I decrypt the ciphertext of Alice's, with Alice's secret key, I will get the message. All right, so we've done encryption, but what is this? So let's think about what does now Alice know about this message M? That old, so we know that it's the original message that somebody sent. So we know it's the, we know it hasn't been tampered with. So that's one of the properties we're going to want to these algorithms, just like we looked at symmetric crypto systems. If somebody tampers with that message, uh, we'll, uh, we'll look at integrity. But we know nobody knows the contents of that message C as it's being sent. What else does Alice know? Or 
or doesn't know. Yeah. Alice doesn't know who sent it. Yeah, Alice has no idea who sent it. Why? Because everyone has access to her public key. Right, so in this example, the people who have Alice's public key are Bob, Eve, and effectively everyone on the planet. Right, everyone has that public key. Alice has no way of knowing who sent that key. Okay, so we have a couple different scenarios. So this is like, I don't know, message comes in. Oh no, not M, sorry. So this is just an encrypted message C. Okay, so we got encrypt. So we have our basically our encrypt and our decrypt operations. Um, but these keys work in the same way. So just like a uh, on our lock example, left and right have no real difference besides their different directions. Um, because we could take Alice could take her secret key, encrypt some message. <laughs> to get some ciphertext. And now, what key can decrypt that message? For public. What was it? For public. For public key. And so then who can do that? Anyone. 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 OK, so let's say Bob does this, right? So Alice sends this C to Bob. And Bob decrypts it with her public key. What does Bob know about that message? came from Alice because the only person who could have encrypted that is the person who has Alice's secret key. But does Bob know if anyone else read this message? Is there any confidentiality guarantee there? So if Alice puts this uh, cypher text C, let's say on her web page or on Twitter or something, who, who could read the message? Everybody had access to the cypher text, yes. but only Alice and Bob can see the message. Why? Because once it's encrypted, you need the secret key to unencrypt it. Uh, we're in this, so we've encrypted it with Alice's secret key. So what do we need to decrypt it? The public key. And who has Alice's public key? Everyone. Everyone. Everyone, which means anyone can read that message. Right, so it's not a, um, so there is no confidentiality guarantees here, right? Here in the previous example, by using Alice's public key, we've got confidentiality. And here we basically have non-repudiation. Because everyone can cryptographically verify, yes, Alice sent this message. Right? This message came from Alice. Everyone can check. Everyone knows that. But also, everyone knows the contents of this message. There's no security here. Which is great, right? So we got some cool security properties. And we so now, we just saw the case where Bob can send a message to Alice with, and without ever using a shared key. Right, so Bob can securely send a message to Alice. Nobody else can read the contents of that message except for Alice. Without prearranging a secret key beforehand. The only requirements are everyone just has to know everyone's public key. But what about combining the two? Would we want to do that? Why would that equal? Uh, Bob can encrypt with Alice's public key. Only Alice. No, no. Can why? Not why. Oh, why? Why not how? Um, to keep everything a secret from the public. Mm, but Bob can do that in the first case, right? So in this first case, confidentiality. Bob can encrypt a message only for Alice with Alice's public key. I can give that message to everyone on Earth, and nobody can decrypt that message unless they have Alice's secret key. Public key. So Eve could just as easily do this operation, generate some ciphertext, 
and send it to Alice and pretend that it was from Bob. Right, so there's, yeah. Could you combine uh, Bob's secret key with Alice's public key? Yeah, so let's think about that. Okay, so now we need Bob. Uh, so now we want to Bob send the uh, M to Alice. Um, Confidential, confidential, and um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of the right term. Uh, and known sender, we'll think for now. There's an easier term, but we haven't introduced that concept yet. So, so we want, so basically, we want Bob to send a message to M to Alice that nobody else can read, and that Alice will know is from Bob. So, what do we think? We have our message M. So we want it to be confidential, so maybe we what encrypt it with Alice's public key. That will give us confidentiality. And then we can use maybe Bob's secret key on that. Get some ciphertext C. Wait, is that actually right? I was trying to do the opposite. Okay, yeah, let's go through this. Okay, this is good. This is that okay. allow anyone to know it's from Bob? So, let's think through this. Okay. So, let's go through this scenario. Alice sends, uh, Bob sends this message C, the ciphertext to Alice. What can Alice do to peel off this last layer? Use Bob's public key C to get, uh, we'll say, I don't know, we'll call it alpha or something. And then how does uh, Alice get this message? Her secret. Her secret key. So Alice's secret key takes alpha and out pops M. But does... Okay, does this mean that this message came from Bob? If M pops out. If M pops out? Okay, think about this. So you're Eve. So Eve, the adversary, can do, let's say, doesn't know secret keys, but can basically do anything else, right? Steal messages in transit, modify messages, right? So let's say Eve gets a hold of C. What can Eve do? Use Bob's public key. Use Bob's public key? So use the public key of Bob with C to get what? Alpha. Alpha. And then, so we, what Eve can't open up Alpha, right? There's no, they don't have, Eve doesn't have access to the secret key of Alpha. There's no way to open up that message and alter the message. But what if I take Alpha and I have my own secret key of Eve, alpha, uh, which gives me, let's say, C prime. I send C prime to Alice. Right, I send this to Alice, C prime. <coughs> Alice thinks it's from me. In our scheme, what does Alice do to verify that? The public key of Eve, C prime, which gives uh, beta. We didn't give it a name yet, but we'll just go with beta. And then the secret key of Alice, she can get beta to get M. So what's the problem here? Or is this a problem? Uh, but I'm telling, uh, I'm telling, like, uh, maybe the message says you owe me a million dollars. You could. Right? So I'm able to take, in this case, Eve can take that message, 
take away Bob's secret key, apply her own secret key on top of that, tell Alice, actually, and block the original message, and say, actually, that this message comes from me. Yeah. I mean, like, intercept messages and this sort of uh, communication between two people. Yeah, so I can be in between them, I can alter their messages, or I can't alter the messages, the content of the message, but I can maybe trick it that it comes from me, yeah. Nothing weird did pop out. M popped out in both cases. So how does um, how does how does Alice know if message M came from Bob or from E? They're both telling her they're sending her this message, but who does it actually come from? The exact same message. Yeah. Isn't the issue because they started with using the public key of Alice so that anyone could have um, made the message in the first place, basically? Right. So the 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 very last thing we did to the original message, what Bob did, was use the secret key of Bob. But the problem is anyone can take off that layer and alter what's inside of it, right? If you think about it like you know, onions or layers, right? So the secret key of Bob, anyone can open that if they have Bob's public key, which everyone does. So what if we swap the two operations? <coughs> So now Bob wants to send a message. We have the um, secret key of Bob first. The secret key of Bob, we put the message and uh, we'll continue with our, use our Greek letters. They're gonna mean something different in this example, but that's fine. Uh, it's gonna be something alpha and then we encrypt it with what? Private key of Bob. Alice's private key. We don't have Alice's private key. Or public key. Public key, yeah. yeah. And we get C. Right? So in our previous example, we can say we basically did this. So now, if we think about it in terms of those layers and like an onion that we're talking about, who can peel off this last layer? Or let's see, what key will be able to peel off that last layer? Alice's secret key. Alice's secret key, and who's the only person that should have that secret key? Alice. 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 So now, same thing, let's walk through our same thing. So Bob says uh, to Alice uh, from Bob. And Alice is like, well, anyone could claim their, their Bob, so let's see if you're actually legit. So Alice takes C, what does she do to it? Use her private key. Yeah, private key, so the, or let's do secret key, because if you use public and private, they're both P's, which doesn't match up with the acronyms here. I have to watch myself, too. Um, so the secret key of Alice passes it to C, and we know up here we get alpha. And then what does she do with alpha? Bob's public key of alpha and gets the message M. So now, okay, but this is exactly, this is the problem. If we just stop here, this is exactly, if we stopped that in the previous example, we would have thought that it was secure, right? So we need to think about what can E do in this situation. So, okay, let's go Eve steal C. The ciphertext. So now, what can Eve do to this message? She can't peel off Nothing. the. Nothing. Can't peel off the outside layer because the secret key of Alice is protecting that. Eve does not know that. She can't change it. The only thing that Eve can do is try to say, well, this message C is to Alice um, from Eve. And. We'll use the Alice will use the secret key of Alice on C to get alpha, and use the uh, pub um, the pub.
public key of Eve with alpha, and then what is this going to give us? Definitely not M, right? I don't know, some, right? It'll be gibberish, garbage, whatever. We, maybe we can have a check for it in our protocol, in the message, whatever, it doesn't matter. We'll look at that later. Um, but fundamentally, that one doesn't be crypt, and so we know that this message is not from E. Cool, so you just defined a whole public key. So, okay, then if we go through this, so Bob just sent a message from Alice to Bob, then how would Alice send a message back to Bob so that Bob knows that it's from Alice? So we have a new message, uh, M prime, from Alice uh, back to Bob. So what do we have to do to get the same properties? Encrypt with their secret. So encrypt what with what? Uh, Alice's message. secret? Yeah, encrypt the message with Alice's secret key. Okay, and then what? <coughs> and then encrypt with Bob's public. Yeah, so we can do that back. We get C prime, we send it to Bob. Bob can do the exact same verification Alice did. And now here we have a communication channel where everyone knows everyone's public key. We've never shared private keys, but we're able to establish a conversation and share messages with Bob. No matter if anyone can intercept or listen to our communications, we know people cannot break um, our communications. So is this a win from in terms of uh, symmetric encryption? Yeah, in what way? Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to meet beforehand. We can talk to each other. Um, Think about if you had to, any website you visited, like the company would have to send you maybe a physical piece of mail so that you could type in your key with them to use. Um, and that's the only way you could use that website. All right, cool. So we just did this. Um, Non-repudiation, we did that. We did confidentiality and non-repudiation. Awesome, cool. The question is uh, how to get that. Yeah, please. So in the Model of the box. Would that just be a box within a box? Say it again. Oh, oh, oh yes. In the mod, yeah. This is why I stopped using the box metaphor. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, because for this to work, you're, you'd have multiple boxes, and they would each be with different people's keys, and you need to like get somebody's box. So we can ignore the box for now. That was just the uh, this idea of these different types of keys. Um, so some of the super interesting things of how you actually what are some operations and um, how can you create these two keys that are linked, right? They must be somehow linked because you can encrypt with one and decrypt with the other. But if you know one, you can't derive the other. It's kind of actually, it's almost like magic. Well, definitely to me. <laughs> um, so this is a super interesting, uh, I don't know, papers, book maybe uh, from 1874 um, talking about this. So. Uh, I'm going to read this. Uh, the same difficulty arises in many scientific processes. Given any two numbers, we may, by a simple and infallible process, obtain their product. What's that talking about? Multiplication. Multipl multiplying two numbers. You've been multiplying numbers your whole life, right? Probably starting in, hopefully, elementary school, <laughs> right? Uh, okay. Uh, but it is quite another matter when a nar large number is given to determine its factors. Right, to go back from a large number and determine what two numbers multiply together to get that. So a basic operation like arithmetic, I mean uh, multiplication, it's easy to go one way, but it's difficult to go the other. Um, can the reader say what two numbers multiplied together will produce the number, um, what is this, 8 trillion, 616 million, 460 thousand, 799? I think it unlikely that anyone but myself will ever know, for there are two large prime numbers and can only be rediscovered in trying in succession a long series of prime divisors until the right one be fallen upon. Oh, this is great. Uh, the work would probably occupy a good computer for many weeks. So what is the author talking about here? A person. A person, right? Yeah, it's important to remember, it's 1874. They're not talking about a computer system. They're talking about a literal human computer who used to do computation and answer questions like this by hand. Uh, the work would probably occupy a good computer for many weeks, but it did not occupy me many minutes to multiply the two factors together. 
right? So essentially he's saying, it took me two minutes to multiply two prime numbers together to get this number that he's showing here, but it would probably take a person two weeks in order to derive those factors. Uh, similarly, there's no direct process for discovering whether any number is a prime or not. It is only by exhaustively trying all inferior numbers, which could be divisors, that we can show there is none, and the labor of the process would be intolerable were it not performed systematically once for all in the process known as the, I always mess this up, is it the sieve or slave sieve of Aristophanes, uh, the result being registered in tables of prime numbers. Okay, so, the, and this is, so this is uh, what's super interesting is taking these ideas of one operation multiplication that is very quick for one party to do and factoring a large number into its uh, constituent factors is very difficult and takes a long time is basically the basis of at least the start of modern public key crypto systems. Um, so we'll look at kind of different ways of thinking about and doing this. Um, but yeah, isn't that kind of crazy? Like somebody in 1874 was talking about this problem and it is the basis of modern public key cryptography. Um, so we'll look first at the Diffie-Hellman algorithm uh, from 76. And this is a way to exchange keys where uh, it's a little bit different than the way we thought about it, but basically we can establish a protocol so that both of us have a shared secret at the end. Um, and then in 1977, uh, this is probably the most famous public key crypto system by uh, uh, Ron Rives, uh, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Adelman. They created RSA, so the RSA is from each of their the acronyms of the, or the first letter of their last names, uh, which was a general public key crypto system. Um, Super interesting though, again, we've maybe seen how the gap between the public and private has narrowed. Um, in 1970, a British cryptographer in, uh, at GCHQ had this idea of non-secret implementation and one of his colleagues actually implemented RSA in 1973. So here, actually again, you see an example where the public is closing the gap in terms of knowledge only four years ahead in necessarily designing these new crypto systems. It's also a great example of uh, like how concurrent discoveries can happen because the ideas are kind of in some sense in the air, um, just waiting for the right people to think about them. Questions on that? Does everyone understand what we mean by like factoring a large number or any number? Right, we want to basically essentially do the reverse <coughs> of that multiplication. So, and uh, we'll get to that in a second. We'll look at Diffie Hellman first. It's pretty cool, and it's um, we won't go into it uh, in depth. But again, I like to think about the um, thinking about the intuition behind these types of algorithms. So the idea is okay. We're going to use paint because this is a great one. Um, so basically, Alice and Bob share some uh, common starting numbers, this paint. Okay, so this would be the yellow here. And then generate their own secret colors. So Alice is generating, I, I will narrate, I'm sorry if you're um, colorblind, that's totally fine. So in this example, Alice and Bob's shared common paint is yellow. That is mixed with Alice has a secret color of orange and Bob has a secret color of teal. And I apologize, I'm realizing I don't actually know what all these colors are. Um, so combine them together to get each a unique different color that is based on the shared color that they agreed on and their own secret color. So uh, Alice gets kind of a yellowy orange, like a light orange. And um, Bob gets a, I don't know, what is it, somebody? Sky blue, maybe? Baby blue? Yeah, okay. I feel like there's a, is a periwinkle a word? Or is that more purpley? Uh, getting off topic. Okay. So they then now generate this new color that's a combination of the other ones. And I don't know. Let's make the assumption. I think it's pretty, that it's difficult to separate back the paint into their constituents' colors. Right? So given sky blue, it would be difficult to know that you got the sky blue through yellow and teal and not. I don't know, blue and lighter, 
white or something? I don't know. So you can think of that there's many different colors that can get you the same color combination. But, and so we can share now this combined color over the public network. We can assume that anyone can steal that, but they can't break it apart, even if they know the yellow. That's the other thing. So somebody can see that yellow, but they can't derive what that other color was we added to it. Um, then the cool thing is by then adding in their secret color, they both have, if we look at this process, so Alice started with yellow and orange and added Bob's, which was yellow and, wait, wait, that's wrong, wait, okay, yeah, there we go, okay. So Alice gets Bob's uh, sky blue, I'm gonna go with that, uh, which contains yellow and teal and adds to it her secret, which is uh, orange and gets a super ugly brown color, um, <laughs> right? So the same three colors were all combined and gets one final result. And then Bob gets the light orange from Alice, which is combined from yellow, the common yellow, Alice's orange, and then mixes that with his secret teal and ends up with the same ugly brown color, right? So, and the idea is anybody looking at those interactions, the yellow and the, um, the sky blue and the light orange going across can't derive what those actually are. Yeah? Isn't the yellow actually public though? So you can just actually derive colors? The colors are more difficult. Yeah, yeah, that's why I'm, uh, the color analogy breaks down slightly, but um, but it's at least a graphical representation of what's going on, that you could actually buy, you could come up with the same common secret. And so, okay, let's think about, yeah, please. Uh, so wouldn't Bob be able to deduce what Alice's secret color is from the same No, it's the same thing. Uh, once the colors are mixed, you can't go back. This is not quite what we want, right? There's no real public keys, secret keys here, like we've talked about, that would be very nice. But could we use this, maybe? So let's say we had some scheme like this. Right? So let's say the common secret, we'll use numbers, I don't know, let's say the common secret is uh, whatever, 10. They both end up with 10 as their common secret number. Now, how do they actually establish a secure communication? Yeah. They s just use symmetric cryptography with Yeah, we can just switch to symmetric cryptography, right? Now we have a shared secret. We've never communicated this number 10 to each other in public, but we both were able to derive it based on our own private data. And so we can use this as the key to an AES session and start talking to each other. So I can send, so uh, Alice and Bob, so Alice can start sending Bob the uh, AES, uh, hello, using the key 10 to Bob and nobody else will be able to break that because AES uses a 256 bit, uh, can use up to a 256 bit key and that's very, very difficult to break. Um, so yeah, now they can use symmetric encryption Yeah, so they have this shared secret. Questions on the concept here? Yeah. Why would they want to switch to symmetric afterwards? Is there some benefit they get from this? Um, in this example, there's nothing else they can do. So in Dippy Hellman, you only end up with a shared common secret, but there's no keys like we talked about. It would be like uh, you and I, I don't really know how to, it'd be like us trying to maybe talk to each other in riddles or something. So we both kind of know what we're talking about and then we write down a cipher based on that key that we're both thinking of. 
okay. but nobody else who's listening can derive what that key is based on our conversation. So it's similar here. At the end, you're just left with a common secret that nobody knows, but I, there's no public key that I can use to encrypt this or decrypt this. So that's why, so Divi Hellman was first, but RSA it was more general. You actually get public private keys that you can use to encrypt things. More questions? symmetric so they can decrypt it, like is what you're saying here? So that they can even have a communication. Um, so this is um, one way of getting around the key problem of symmetric key cryptography where you need a shared secret key. And the question that we always brought up was, well, how do you share that secret key? <laughs> but here in this case, we can run this Divi Hel Hellman algorithm, both derive the same secret key, and nobody else who's listening to our communication can derive that same key. Anybody in the back? And I really like this diagram. It's one of my favorites. Um, OK, and then you could go through the exact details of the algorithm. They're not super important. Um, but we can walk through them a little bit. So they agree to some values, P and G. Uh, Alice and Bob both create a secret. In this case, Alice is a 4, Bob is 3. Um, then the sending is Alice will send Bob, uh, what is this, a nine, so nine to the four, so um, raising the G to whatever her secret is, mod 23, which is P, to get six. Bob sends Alice, uh, let's say Alice B, I don't know what that means. Um, whatever, uh, Bob sends Alice B, so raises nine to the third, mod 23, 16. And then they both compute with that value. Uh, Alice computes, what is this, uh, 16 to the fourth. So 16 is what she gets from Bob to the fourth, raises it to her secret. Mod 23 is nine. And Bob computes S with BS uh, with, what, with, with what he gets from Alice, uh, which is six. Six to the third, mod 23 is nine. So they both end up with nine. Um, this uh, properties of exponentiation I expect you to know exactly why this works. I know, I want you to know the intuition behind what's attempting to be going on here and what the end result of all this computation is. Cool. Okay, but then RSA is going to be built on exactly that idea that was essentially present in that paper of prime numbers. So just like, um, what's his name? I should figure out his name. Just like uh, Will, or maybe we call him Bill. Um, just like Bill did, you choose two distinct prime numbers, so different numbers, P and Q. You're going to then multiply them together. Right? Simple operation, and computers can do that pretty quickly. And the idea is, and this is what everything is based on, is if we have N, we, it is difficult to break it apart into P and Q. Agree? Don't agree? And we can maybe look at this later, but we're talking about huge numbers, like very long digit numbers uh, that influences our operations. But when we do this, we can do this very easily. We can uh, multiply n times q, or p times q. And then, so for our encryption operation, so we also have this notion that if we have um, some a that's between 0 and n, so any value that's less than n, and we have some e that's greater than 0, if we raise a to the e mod n, gets us some ciphertext c. So we can, we can take any number, a, raise it to a power, Mod that with n, that's a very easy operation. There's nothing difficult there. It's just multiplication and mod. Now the goal is given if we have c, e, and n, it's difficult to calculate a, or that's, um, okay. All right. So 
now we have uh, the C that we've calculated. We have E, we have N, and it's going to be difficult to go backwards to calculate A. All right. Okay. Uh, so we are going to then compute another value M. So we have N, which is mul multiplying the two of them together. We're going to have M, which is each of those values minus 1. So the prime values P and Q, minus 1, multiplied together. And then we're going to pick another E that's less than 1 and M. We will compute a value D that's E to the negative 1 mod M. Um, <coughs> Okay, so essentially, man, I don't want to get into all these details. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, we're basically there. Um, so essentially, we do a lot of uh, easy math in terms of key generation. There are some tricks here, like, um, so even if we go back to what uh, Bill said in his letter, um, how did he say you had to detect if a number is prime? Anyone remember? Yeah, why? It's only divisible by itself in one. Yeah, because it's only divisible by itself in one, so you need to, in his mind, you need to check all of the previous primes, essentially, to see if uh, it's divisible by any of those. And only if it's not, then it's a prime number. Um, and as it gets more and more, that's, so he was talking about tables, so it's really nice to have tables. Um, it turns out there's crazy other algorithms where you can <coughs> get assurance that a number is uh, prime. So it can be, you can be like 99.999% sure that a um, number is prime without generating and having to do a lot of work. Um, so really, the, that's kind of the difficult part. Everything else is easy. We end up with our public and our secret keys. And then, now we have this uh, way to turn a message into an integer. So we're limited here in this scheme by sending messages that are less than um, n. So our Bob, Bob's n, which was, um, yeah, so Bob, the n is uh, p times q. Yeah, that makes sense. OK, right. So this makes sense. So let's break this down a little bit. OK, so we give people the public key. We give people n. Everyone knows n. Right? By the basis of what we're doing this on, you can't fact. It is very difficult possible to factor n, this entire scheme breaks down because somebody could derive p and q and then they break the whole system. Cool. So we turn our message into an integer that's less than n and Alice does m, so it takes the message, lowercase m, turns it into an integer. Uh, you can do this kind of however you want mods that with n, uh, raise that to the d power, which is given, so that's Bob's d, mod n, uh, sends c, and Bob can take c, raise it to the e, which is part of his secret parameter that he never gives anyone, mod n, and that actually gives the message. So Eve, even with, um, yeah, with the ciphertext, the public key of Bob and the public key of alpha, um, essentially because this E value gives you everything you need in order to uh, decrypt the messages. So anyways, this is just a brief overview of this encryption algorithm. If you're interested, you should uh, definitely check that out more. I believe we, yeah, we have, we have an undergrad crypto class. Yeah, okay, so there's an undergrad crypto class. If you wanna get into this stuff, you should do that. Um, so, okay, from this, we get really nice things. So we can send numbers less than N but how do we actually turn this into a real crypto system? So we want to send a message like hello. Yeah, what if we just applied encryption to each letter? So we turned each letter into it's ASCII value equivalent. All of those will definitely be less than n. We can do that computation, send a bunch of these uh, uh, integers over, and Bob can decrypt it. What does 
that look like? Look like this. We don't have to go through all the details, but let's say. Uh, so we have the message H E L L O. Right? And so we have some RSA. Um, well, we can think we have our public key of Bob. So Alice is trying to message, send a message to Bob. Uh, let's say just encrypt it for Bob, doesn't care about non repudiation. Um, so our public key basically can take in an integer and returns an integer. So what we could do here is public key of Bob. Uh, we did this before. Does anybody remember? Um, oh, uh, have this up. Six, 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 seven. Six, seven? Six, six? I can't remember. Yeah, me neither. OK, that's fine. It uh, doesn't really matter if so I'm going to encrypt it into something gibberish uh, or something random. Let's say that decrypts a 10, or encrypts a 10, uh, takes the public key of Bob, 0x62. Uh, Encrypts that into 0x54, uh, uh, pb 0x maybe 68, 0x uh, f1. And what's the next one going to be? 68, f1. f1. Why? Yeah, exact same letter. Um, I don't know what O is. I'm running out of numbers. 70. Okay. So when I send all these letters, uh, all these um, numbers to Alice, Alice, or to Bob. Bob decrypts them, comes backwards, gets the message. What's the problem here? We've seen this problem before. Frequency. Pattern. Yeah, there's a pattern, right? The pattern in the letter still remains even in my ciphertext. Right? We want encryption that, and this was the key problem we saw with ECB, right? Electronic code books. That if you, uh, you may not be able to tell exactly what that letter is, but you definitely know that it's the same letter repeated, right? Which can tell you information about the text, and you definitely want to avoid that. So we can't do that. We need some way to turn this whole string represented as an integer. So maybe one thing we could do is say, okay, well, I have all the values here. Why don't I just encrypt uh, 0x67626868670? And I'll get some value back, I send that, they decrypt it, great. Is that going to work? It'll work. What's the problem? Yeah. It could end up being too big. Yeah, it could end up being too big. We're limited by n, so we're limited by the n, which was uh, p times q, the, um, oh, that's not a q. Right, by the prime numbers that we derived, even if we, you know, sent pretty large uh, primes, you know, we're still limited here by the size of messages we have to send. So, okay, maybe we then, well, then we have to break the message up, but still, then we can't protect all the messages with the public key. We end up with a whole lot of a pain. So, what do we do? Are we just stuck? Yeah. What if you pair every letter with a random letter and then Bob can just ignore the second letter? Okay, I think you may be able to do that, but then in that case you're still... Hmm. So you're sending two letters at a time? Yeah, you're doubling up your bandwidth and your message is twice as big as before, which is tough. That's a tough sell. I think that actually would get rid of this problem. That's interesting. What's a fixed size thing that maybe we can encrypt that would allow us to then encrypt however much we wanted, maybe? Symmetric key. What was that? Symmetric key. A symmetric key. Yeah, we use the same technique as before, right? So we can generate basically a random AES key. And then we send, so we have the message. Uh, we take the message, 
we encrypt. Oh, well, that's not right. Take the message. Uh, I'm going to call this lowercase k. That's insane to rewrite. So we run AES on the message. Get k. We get uh, c. Now do I send? But I can't send Bob k in the in the clear, right? That's the problem we're trying to get around. But I can encrypt with Bob's public key. K. To get, um, I'm gonna call it CK. What was that? So then, so then I send both of them. I send C and CK uh, to Bob. Now, how does Bob decrypt this? So let's think about it first. If Eve steals any of these things, can Eve decrypt C? Why not? She doesn't have the she doesn't have the K. She doesn't have key the key K right. This is the uh, what's protecting this right. It's encrypted with K. Can she get K? So we have C K. Can Eve decrypt that? Who's the only person that can decrypt C K? Bob's secret key. Right? So then when Bob gets this, he says, oh, okay, great, CK, let me decrypt that with my secret key. And that gives me CK, Bob, yeah, um, K. And then he can take uh, AES, put C in with K, and get the message in. So now we can use, and it turns out, so the other really nice thing here is that um, exponentiation, especially with uh, very, very large numbers, is very slow on modern hardware systems. Whereas AES, something like AES, which was uh, XORs and SWATs and these kind of things, is very, very fast. Um, so most modern crypto systems want to limit the amount of public key cryptography they're doing because um, it's and it's very slow based on the size of the data because you're taking um, the data, you're exponentiating it. It's a very slow process. So this is how basically modern systems work uh, to do that. Let's see, are we here? Yeah, okay. So yeah, we can use RSA to transmit an AES key. Um, and this would be sending a message. We also now have a nice um, session that's out with Bob. So Bob can send us messages, AES messages with that key. We know that only the two of us know that key. Well, questions here? Hand almost up. You might as well put it up. Couldn't you also use Diffie Hellman to exchange the keys and then use AES? Yes. Um. Can you do that instead if you want to like even faster? I don't know that it is necessarily faster. I think um, it's a good question. I don't know the ultimate answer there. But I know, let's see, there's also more modern um, public key crypto systems that are based on elliptic curves, which are the public and private keys are smaller. Um, computation can be faster. So those are used more than RSA. But Diffie Hellman is very infrequently used, let's say. I know it's, I think it's used in very specific cases, but I don't know all of them off the top of my head. Okay, but we actually encountered a problem earlier. So going back to this example, where Eve tried to mess with a message, or let's think of a different situation. So, um, well, All right, yeah, this situation. How does Alice know that this is garbage and this is the original message? Readability, readability maybe one, but what if I'm sending you a, I don't know, 
I mean, it's not trivially noticeable as, what if it's a zip file? So zip file by itself is not readable necessarily. It has some structure. Maybe it's a uh, reading from a sensor that is inherently noisy and random looking. Yeah, we need something to validate it, right? And specifically, so what security property is that that we want? <laughs> integrity, right? We want some way to verify the integrity of this message. Has this message been altered in transit to us, right? Or that's one of the ways we've thought about integrity. Has somebody messed with this message? Uh, another way of thinking about it is, has anybody, what was the original message that Bob wanted to send? How can we verify that this is actually the message Bob wanted to send, and that nobody's messed with it. Yeah, so this is kind of the, the scenario here is, what if an attacker flips a bit, right? Or, or if the bit is corrupted in the message as it's getting sent, how do we know that the message is actually garbage versus what we wanted the message to be? All right. So to do that, we got to talk about some super interesting functions. Um, so the idea here is we're going to be talking about um, now cryptographic hash functions. There's several different types of hash functions, and we'll talk about what makes them specifically good for cryptographic applications. Um, but you should basically, uh, so the idea is a hash function is essentially a function that maps that takes in as much data as you can give it, so arbitrary size data, and outputs a fixed size bit string. Okay, let's go about this a different way. Cool. Let's think about what we want from this. Hash functions. Uh, let's call our hash function h. We'll try to think about what properties we want from h. So we have a message m that we want to send, uh, that we want to maybe calculate some hash on. So we, we basically want the property of if I, and let's not worry, we're only focused on integrity right now. So let's not worry about confidentiality or anything like that. Um, So how does Alice send to Bob a message M and a way for Bob to verify the integrity of that message, that it didn't get corrupted along the way? So we're going to think about the, the hash. So in some sense, we want Bob to be able to check if M has been tampered with. So okay. Well, let's go through the real scenario. Okay. Um, okay, so let's say I don't okay, this is a let's say Okay, since we've been doing this, let's derive uh, what we actually want to have happen, and then we'll look at this function. This makes more sense. Okay. So, I have my message, I have my hash function, I can run the hash function on the message. It, let's say, tells me, um, lets me know in some sense if the message has been tampered with or not. So, I have this information, I want to send it from Alice to Bob. If it's confidential, what do I do? And I don't care that he knows it com came from me. Encrypt it with his public key. Public key of Bob. And I'll pass, uh, I'm just gonna put commas. So message, well, go with this. So, hmm. so I have C, 
and public key of Bob, the hash of the message, and I will get the cryptographic a hash. Bob gets these C and CH. So what does Bob do? So he can decrypt the message. The secret key of Bob with the ciphertext returns M question mark? We don't know, right? Maybe it's been altered. Maybe the message got altered. In maybe C got altered in transit. We don't really know. Um, so Bob can also take the secret key of Bob and the hash of M. We'll see this is not actually necessary, but uh, to get the hash of M. So we'll call this uh, M hat because we're unsure. We'll carry on, on the M. So now how can Bob check if M hat is the same as what Bob originally sent? So run it through our hash function, M hat. And we want to check, does this equal the hash of M that we got here? If it does, and if H is a good function, a cryptographically secure hash function, Bob can be secure in the fact that this was the actual message that Bob wanted to send. Okay. But what properties do we want? Why don't, like, um, so I talked about some things like fixed output size, yeah. Yes. Good, good, good. Thank you. Yeah, great. Getting ahead of myself. All right. So, what if M is huge? Like 100 gigabytes. I mean, C is roughly 100 gigabytes. What about CH? Do we want that also to be 100 gigabytes? No, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? If we have to send a, a hash of a message that is the size of the message itself, we've failed in some sense, right? So we want it to be small. So, okay, so we're going to say, well, H of M Fixed size output. What else do we want about our hash function? Maybe I'll say one. It needs to be deterministic, right? Given the exact same input, it needs to produce the exact same output, right? We want. change in the input should produce a fairly large change in the output. Yeah, so let's think about that. Okay, so another thing that Alice may want to do, right, so we, um, actually now we have enough uh, maybe understanding here to understand this motivation. So we have, um, so Alice has a message M. Alice is going to, let's say, predict that, uh, or Alice wants to send a message she wants non-repudiation. She wants everyone to know that it com comes from Alice, but the message is huge. Tens of gigabytes, right? Maybe it's her research data or whatever. But she wants everyone to know that that data is from her. And we actually saw if we um, encrypt that with, if Alice takes her secret key, encrypts this very large message, 
she'll get some ciphertext C that everyone else can decrypt with their public key, with Alice's public key to verify that it's hers to get that message. But it's very large, it's a very slow operation. And Alice actually doesn't want everyone else to have to decrypt this message. It's just a public message. But she wants everyone to know that it came from her. So Alice is just going to release M. But how does anyone know that nobody's tampered with M? What was that? So they don't. They don't, right? Because somebody could have altered M, or actually, maybe the best example of this is like software packages, right? So you're installing software, just a giant blob that came from a server somewhere else that you don't know. How do you know that the author of that software actually intended it, and that nobody else is, is altering that along the way? Or at least the hash of it. Yeah, so, so one thing is, I can release the hash of M. So Alice releases the hash of M and M. So now public M, hash of M. So I can get both of those. I can compute M. I can compute the hash of M, make sure that hash that I compute matches what's actually there. But now Eve goes in, hacks into this server, creates M prime, and then calculates the hash of M prime and tricks everybody and says, hey, this is actually Alice's data, even though I've changed it and messed with it. So if Alice doesn't want to do uh, public key crypto on her message, what if she encrypted this with her secret key, the hash? Right? And this is a small value, so we can think um, maybe 512 bytes, bits? I don't know. We'll look at different ones 64 bits, 128 bits, 256 bits, whatever. So, fast operation. Get, uh, no, not CK. We'll go CH. Now, we have out there in the world, Alice has published M and CH. So now, you want to check, did anybody alter this message? What do you do? You download M, we'll call it M hat, because we don't know what it is. So we get M hat, we get CH. What do we calculate? Yeah, we crypt the, let's say the hash of m hat, and we want to check, uh, does this equal the, I put key there instead of Alice, sorry about that. The, with Alice's public key, ch, and now if that checks out, I know nobody has altered that message, right? So Eve can hack in, Eve can change this to m prime, and leave ch alone, in which case this check should fail, right? We want it to be the case that if that message is altered, that it, it won't be the case that they match. Um, what if Eve puts in M prime and uh, CH prime, which is something from her, so she calculates uh, the secret key of Eve, H of M prime is equal to CH prime. fail to decrypt with uh, Alice's yeah, it'll fail to match. And we actually don't care that it fails to decrypt. There's actually a great property here. We don't care that it gives us gibberish. We just know that it's not going to match. When we decrypt that, that is not going to match our calculation of the hash. Because we would use Alice's public key to decrypt something that was encrypted with Eve's secret key. So we would never get those hashes to match. OK. So now we're starting to develop some properties. So. Deterministic, we want to say, uh, and we went with this earlier, right? Somebody, I can't remember who said, um, we'll kind of talk about this a little informally. Um, oops, sorry. So we want it to be the case that H of M does not equal H of M prime, right? So if you make a change to M, the hashes should be different. Can we actually guarantee that that's the case? Why not? Huh? Yeah, well, 
Yeah, and the reason why is we said there's a fixed size output. So if you only have 32 bits, but you accept arbitrarily large inputs, there will be at least, uh, well, right? There's only 2 to the 32 inputs that would be different bit combinations. And at some point, you will need to have multiple ones. Like you, you, there is the case that you'll have different ends that match to the same thing. So this is other properties we want. Oh, so there's another couple, of, well, more properties we want, some of which are um, things that it's, what we talked about, like a small change in an input bit. So it shouldn't be the case that we change one bit and the hash changes by one bit. Because then maybe an attacker can use that to um, seal our, uh, to understand and break the algorithm. And fundamentally, we want it to be also easy to compute and difficult to go backwards. So we'll talk about what those mean. And, oh, there we go. We just did this. That's great. Did the hash. Uh, cool. OK, then we'll look at more hash functions on, tu on Tuesday.